بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على تمان لأكملان خير خلق الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So we continue our discussions with the صفة الصلاة النبي or the Prophet's prayer described and we are now at the pillars of the prayer and inshallah, we will conclude this discussion today bi'awnillahi ta'ala. We have discussed reciting the Fatiha and we mentioned the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that there is no salah illa bi Fatiha til kitab except with the Fatiha of the Book of Allah azza wa jal. We also discussed a couple of scenarios regarding the Fatiha. A person who cannot recite the Fatiha or just doesn't know, we discussed a few options for them that they can use by having a paper there or at least having somebody to accompany and encourage them and to teach them until they know the Fatiha as best as possible, insha'Allah ta'ala. And then we went to, or this is where we're at today, is the bowing position. The bowing position, of course, or the ruku' is also one of the rukn or the pillars of the salah. Without it, there is no prayer. And this is based on an authentic narration of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He mentions, فَرْكَعْ حَتَّى تَطْمَئِنَّ رَاكِعًا So perform the ruku' until you are comfortable in that ruku'. This concept of الطَّمَئِنَّ or comfortable or tranquility, ease, all of these things inshaAllah has a separate discussion by itself and we will talk about that at its appropriate time. Um, that is part of the wajibat of the salah. The things that are just a, a, at a lower degree from the pillars of the salah. A wajib act is that if you miss it, then you would perform the sajda just before the salah is over. And we will talk about that in some of its fiqh, uh, inshallah, in our next discussion. The ruku, how should the ruku be done? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam once mentioned to us or gave us a sifa or a description of how the ruku' should look. And basically when a person performs a ruku', there should be or they should be able to balance some water on their backs. Or they should be able to put a cup of water on their back and it should remain there whilst they're in the form or in the state of ruku'. Sitting or standing in the ruku' in a halfway gesture is not called ruku' and according to many of the fuqaha, a person who does this, the ruku' is not counted and as a result the whole salah itself is not counted. You'll find that some people they'll barely get down to the ruku' decision, they'll barely reach or touch the knees and this is what they count as a ruku'. So this is, this is extremely important in terms of how the ruku' should be done. The ruku' its supporting cast are your two hands. Your two hands should be at least upon the knees or the knee area. Some ulama put a dislikeness if you were to hold your legs, if you put your hands below your knees and you hold from there. As a matter of fact, um, Shaykh al-Bani rahimahullah and others have said that this is actually a hated hated act or etiquette when it comes to the ruku' in the salah itself because it illustrates an image of laziness in the prayer and you don't want to do that. Prayer is never supposed to look like a lazy act of worship. It's always supposed to look refined. It's always supposed to feel as though you're doing it for the first time in, in, the, in your entire life. Every single time you do it, you always have to feel as though you're perfecting it each and every single time. So you want to maintain that even with the ruku and all of the other positions. Number, or number five, after the ruku is over. Now just before we go to the standing up uh, position, the ruku' here, how far apart should your feet be when you're performing the ruku'? It should be the same when you're standing in the salah as well. So it should be equivalent or equal to the shoulder width of that individual. Sometimes you might pray with a person or somebody beside you. And you'll notice that for some reason when they get into the ruku', their feet are widespread for some reason. It's as almost as if when they get into ruku', they're gonna attack that position or something. Or they just get into it and they really feel the strength or the power of that movement and they just lengthen or they broaden 
the space between their feet when they're standing in the ruku. Again, these are all careless issues that go against the perfection of the salah. So you want to avoid it. You want your salah to be as perfect as possible, inshallah. Then you come up to the standing position. And obviously this is when you say Sami'allahu liman hamida And then a series of du'as can follow Rabbana wa lakal hamd Or Rabbana wa lakal hamd Hamdan tayyiban mubarakan fi And other things can also can be said as well The problem with this Is when you stand up from the ruku' position It is actually hated in the salah position To look up to the sky And a lot of people they do this They will say Rabbana wa lakal hamd And they would look up to the sky And there is a specific hadith about this Of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Negating this action It's an action that is hated when it comes into the salah One of the wisdoms that's mentioned in the explanation of this particular hadith Is that this was one of the manners or one of the methods of how the mushrikun Used to worship their idols and used to worship their uh, lords that they used to be devoted to One of the ways they used to do that is they used to look up into the sky And worship them at the same time and then it also led to other problematic issues as well. Imagine if you're praying outside on a sunny day under the blazing sun and dhuhr. You're not going to always do this because you know the sun's going to be piercing right in your eyes anyways. So that's why you just want to avoid that altogether. When it comes to Rabbana wa lakal hamd, again your focus should be always on the sujood area which we'll talk about shortly. Then it goes down to the sujood itself. Now, the question here is, how do you go from the standing position to sujood? Do you go down knees first, or do you go down with hands first? What is the, what is the opinions amongst the ulama regarding this? Now, there is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ telling us not to go down into the ruku' position the way that a camel will sit. And if you look at the way that a camel will sit, it will bend two of its legs and then the rest of its body will follow. But the problem with that is when the Prophet ﷺ mentions this, scholars they derived a benefit out of this and that is the whole issue with the knees versus the hands first. Many of the scholars of hadith, they encourage that you should go down with your hands first and then your knees. Because the Prophet ﷺ says don't go down to rukur. Uh, sorry, don't go down to sujood the way that the camel will sit. The camel will fold up its knees and then it will sit down. But here's the issue. The issue is, the issue is scholars differ on what exactly is the knees of a camel. Because, I mean, for many of the Arabs, but maybe some of the rest of us here, we might have, we're probably used to seeing how the camels, how they maneuver. The way the front legs of a camel, the way it bends or it folds when it gets into a sitting position, the front legs do the exact same thing as the back leg does. So can you believe there is actually a khilaf that scholars differ on what exactly is the knees of a camel? Because they have the exact same components, the exact same function, so they differ on that issue. That's why some of the fuqaha, they said no, um, going down with your knees first is permissible and as a, as a matter of fact the more correct opinion simply because there's an ikhtilaf in this issue and some of the ulama also mentioned that this was a practice of various companions as well various companions used to go down with their knees first followed by their hands um, Allah Azza wa Jal knows best I found that in my research in this particular mas'ala I found that the evidences for both are very good the evidence for both options are very good and very strong and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best but it seems as though insha'Allah both of them are acceptable. Now when, you per when a person goes into sujood there are a number of different mistakes that happen in sujood and that's the approach that I want to take with this. First of all we all know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions that there are seven parts of the body that should touch when you're in sujood and we all know this. The problem is, is that what happens if you go into sujood and you lift your hands up like this and then you go back down into the sujood or you place it back down to the, to the bottom or what a lot of uh, people they do 
is that when they're in sujood, their feet are suspended in the air. I don't know why. I don't know if they're just airing their feet out or what. But a lot of people, they do this, is that when they're in the sujood, instead of the toes touching the ground, it's suspended in the air, just like that. And if you look at it very carefully, it's very obvious what the ruling behind this is. The sujood doesn't count. Because the Prophet ﷺ tells us specifically, it's a specific number that he gives us. Seven parts must touch the ground when you're in sujood. It's so direct, it's so specific. It's not even a general hadith that you should try to do this or seven a, a proximity of your body should touch the ground. It's, spe it's specific parts that are actually mentioned in the hadith. So you want to make sure that the toes are touching the ground. Now when it comes to the toes itself, does it just need to touch the ground itself or should it be bent towards facing the qibla? This is part of the perfection of the sujood. So when your feet are actually touching the ground, you want to at least place some pressure onto the toes and that way at least most of the toes can face towards the qibla as much as possible. Third point when it comes to the feet, should they be wide apart or should they be uh, touching together like this? According to majority of madhahib, excluding the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, the feet should be together. This is also the opinion of the majority of fuqaha, including Sheikh bin Baz and Sheikh Uthaymin rahmatullahi alayhim, that you should try to get the ankles to touch uh, together when you are in the sujood itself. So you want to make sure you do that. What's the wisdom behind this? The wisdom is very interesting and uh, a lot of scholars they've mentioned this wisdom and it's consistent for a lot of them and that is it's to avoid if your eyes when you're in sujood and you happen to lift your nose and you can see the back of your feet it's to avoid any fitna for your eyes in other words any distractions so if you happen to be in the sujood and you look back all you'll see is your feet so your feet actually create a wall from you seeing anything beyond that from the back so it keeps you focused it keeps you in line and wallahi you know subhanallah this is one of the or one of the parts of the perfection of prayer of how perfect salah is and the movements of the salah itself sujood is a miracle from allah azza wa jal sujood is also a time where these are just like a couple of practical issues where the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam whenever he would be in sujood many times he would have hassan and hussein that would come and jump on top of his back and start pulling on his garment and start playing with him. And one time the Prophet Sallallahu he felt that Hassan and Hussein was on his back. So he lengthened the sujood until they would come off. This is in order that when he got out of it, they wouldn't fall off and injure themselves. And can you imagine this kind of rahmah and playfulness of the Prophet ﷺ, the kind of consideration that he had, that even at the position where you are closest to Allah Azza wa Jal, still he would make sure that those children were safe. He would actually lengthen that period just to cater for that. So the reason why I mention this is because we get this question a lot about children that want to play with the parents whilst they're in, you know, in the salah. It's usually like a very fascinating moment for a lot of children when their parents are doing that. So you want to, inshallah, cater for that as best as you can. It's not a major problem. So if you happen to be in the sujood and you happen to be in the ruku and your child is jumping on your back or holding on to your neck and going for the ride throughout the entire salah, wallahi, this is something hasan, this is something good and inshallah something that doesn't affect your salah in any way, shape or form. If it is possible, you can also place the child to the ground and keep them there as best as you can. A lot of really interesting scenarios come out of this. What happens if you're holding a baby and the baby wets its diaper? And are you allowed to hold that child now while it has a messy diaper or not? So the fuqaha, they mentioned that in this case here, you should put down the child. Especially if the child has a dirty diaper. If the child has or messes the diaper whilst they're in your hand, this is a different case. But if it's already messed and the child is crying and you pick up that child, this is something that is highly disliked in the salah. Simply because, you know, certain odors and things that might distract you in the prayer. And especially if a diaper, if a diaper is not, you know, if it doesn't uh, absorb very well, then you don't want the athar or the effects to come on your clothes either because then that leads you to another issue in terms of the validity of your salah. 
um, also with the sujood as well. It is also encouraged that when a person is in the sujood, that when their forehead touches the ground, they should try to include the bridge of their nose to the forehead. The Prophet ﷺ does mention that the nose and the head uh, or the forehead should touch the ground. Scholars differ on this part of your face right here. Is this considered to be part of the nose or this is considered to be part of the forehead? And according to the vast majority, it's considered to be part of the forehead. And um, the reason why I mention that is um, you literally should try to place a small amount of pressure. Don't hurt yourself with it, but a small amount of pressure when you're in the sujood to allow this area to get to the carpet or touch the, 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 the floor as much as possible as part of perfecting that sujood. Now don't do what some Muslims do. Some Muslims use that as a ticket to sort of pressurize and grind their faces into the ground so they can inshallah get that sujood mark on their face you know and obviously this is a type of deception and kathib and dishonesty in the salah itself that is something allah will give you or allah will snatch away from you and it inshallah regardless perfect your salah and allah will give you nur regardless of what regardless of the situation regardless if you have that mark there or not inshallah allah will always increase you once you perfect and you care the salah as best as you can another issue with the sujood and that is if you happen to be in the sujood how far should your arms be uh, uh, spread apart when you're in the sujood as for the men you want to have your hands spread apart as much as possible that a small child or an animal could pass through underneath the arms. The Prophet ﷺ, when he performed the sujood, you were able to see the bottom of his armpit area when he was in the sujood itself. So you want to do that. As for the women, it's the complete opposite. For a woman, she tries to keep her hand as close to her body as possible. And this is part of, of course, of her nature and her modesty and her haya and, her haya and all of these other crucial issues about her. So she tries to keep it as close, the man, as far as possible. This is difficult when you're in jama'ah. So don't worry about it when it comes to jama'ah. In the jama'ah, make sure that whenever you're praying in a jama'ah, don't bring harm or discomfort to the people around you. Because there could be a possibility is that if you disturb the individuals beside you, you may be accountable for that disturbance in that individual salah on Yawm al Qiyamah. Let me give you an example. This is such a classic example because it happens so often. Whenever somebody comes late for salah or they come late for Jumu'ah, then what do they try to do? A lot of the times they, they will try to get closer and closer to the, line, to the front line as much as possible. And even if it means they squeeze themselves in there and you have the brother like this, you know, and he's praying and he's ready for his salah. And then, you know, subhanAllah, a lot of Muslims have try to find all the loopholes possible to make something right. So you'll find that the brother, he'll pray now, he's like this, he'll pray, but he'll take the shortcut and he'll stand like this, and he'll have his hand this way. Just looking for all the shortcuts to lose the perfection of the salah itself. You don't want to do that. Because even though the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to get to the front line as much as possible, do it in the manner the Prophet ﷺ also encouraged to do. The Prophet ﷺ, when he tells us that, he doesn't tell us to cause discomfort to the people around you. He doesn't cause to cause a problem within the line. Do it in comfort. As a matter of fact, there's another hadith the Prophet ﷺ tells us that when you come to the salah, don't run to it, but come to it with ease and tranquility and sakina as you come to the salah. And it doesn't matter if you miss a raka'ah, because you can always make up that raka'ah insha'Allah. Just accept the fact that, you know, for some reason you came to the salah late, find a comfortable space. This way you can focus on your prayer and the people around you can also do the same. So, you know, subhanAllah, a lot of people, they get very upset about this. Some of you might have probably seen in like other places that you might pray that, you know, some Muslims, they'll fight, you know, they'll get into an argument like, brother, what's wrong with you? Why are you doing this? And it gets into a confrontation, it gets into a problem. So try to avoid this as best as possible and come to the salah with a clean heart, a clean mind, with good manners and etiquette, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. Another issue when it comes to the sujood. 
So we talked about the hands, how far apart they should be. What about the fingers? Should you have your fingers spread wide apart onto the floor or should they be together? Again, it goes back to one concept. You want to make sure that every part of your body as much as possible is facing towards the Qibla. So when you pray, keep your hands or your fingers together and allow them to be in front of or facing towards the Qibla as much as possible. So you want to make sure that you do that as well. So you have the toes covered, the, the feet are together, the hands are spread apart, the fingers are together, the nose and the forehead and the bridge, everything is touching the ground, and this is your time between you and Allah Azza wa Jal. Take advantage of it. Take advantage of every single moment you have there. Take advantage even if it's just for a brief moment to just say Astaghfirullah. After you do your Subhan Rabbi Al-A'la three times or whatever, take advantage and squeeze in Astaghfirullah. Squeeze in some quick dua that you can think of, at least to take advantage of that moment as best as you can. Don't just go with the flow of the Imam. And then before you know it, you want to start your dua and you can't finish anything and then you get upset and you go up to the Imam, why are you shortening the prayer so long? So the Imam takes it upon himself in the next salah to lengthen the sujood. Then the next brother comes up to him and said, why are you taking so long to pray? So what you want to do is just take advantage of whatever is presented to you. The Imams, I have a whole discussion for you inshallah. Anybody here who is uh, a regular in leading salah, wherever it is, whether it's in a masjid or in your home, you have specific rules that you follow. You have specific guidelines that are very, very crucial for yourself as opposed to anybody or as opposed to the jama'ah behind you. So that I have a whole discussion just for the imams alone, inshallah, of some of the etiquettes that you should follow when leading others in salah. Um, let's move on now to the sitting position between the two sujoods. So that sitting position there is what is titled as the Jilsatul Istiraha. It's, it's more or less a resting period between the, the two sujoods. And the reason why is that the sujood itself is difficult. Whether you think of it this way or not, it's difficult to place yourself into that position. All the blood and all everything is just roaming into your face. It's coming down to the bottom. It's putting a lot of pressure and heat onto you. It's very difficult to maintain that for a long period of time. You have to train yourself to do sujood for a long time. It's not something that's going to happen spontaneously. So one of the ways, one of the wisdoms behind this, of course, is the sitting position between the two sujood. This is your resting period. It's an opportunity for you to gather yourself for a brief moment. And obviously there's a dhikr or something, a tasbih that is said there, Allahumma ghfirli or Rabbi ghfirli. You could say it a few times. Then you go back to the sujood again. And the whole process is repeated. The, uh, in addition to that, possessing tranquility and calmness throughout the prayer. We touched on this very briefly. This is the tama'nina that we are talking about. Now, as far as this is concerned, there is a very long hadith that is mentioned in Bukhari. And the proof for this is um, the fourth pillar of this particular hadith. And listen to this hadith. This hadith mentions a man that came into the masjid and he prayed. Then he came forward to give salams to the Prophet wasallam, so he returned the salam. So after this man finished praying, he went up to the Prophet wasallam to say salamu alaykum to him. So the Prophet wasallam returned the salam. And then he told him, return and pray, verily or indeed you have not prayed. فَإِنَّكَ لَمْ تصلي, For verily you have not prayed. So the man went back a second time and prayed the exact same way that he prayed the first time. And then he came back and the Prophet ﷺ told him to go back and pray again. So this happened approximately three times. So the man said, by the one who sent you with the truth. So he's basically saying, by Allah. I do not know how to pray any better than this. So the Prophet ﷺ said, if you stand up for prayer, give the takbir. That's one. 
Listen to the first thing the Prophet ﷺ tells him. If you stand up for prayer, it's very interesting. He says to him, if you stand up. He doesn't say when you stand up. This is also one of the one of the evidences that show it's permissible for you to pray in different positions, sitting down or lying down or praying with your heart if none of these other uh, situations work for you. So he says to them, if you do stand up for prayer, give the takbir. Then read what you are able to from the Quran. Quran. So read whatever is easy for you from the Quran. Then bow until you are calmly in the bowing position. Go into the ruku until you feel a sense of calmness. Let's pause here for a moment. How do you know when you have tama'nina in your ruku and in your sujood and all of the different movements of the salah? You know when you're in the ruku, the moment that you get into the ruku, so I want to demonstrate this. I'll do this myself. So you know that you're in the ruku when you do this. So you're in the ruku, and I can't tell really if my back, how back, how straight my back is, but you're in there, and the moment that you get into your ruku, you feel relaxed. Like right now, I feel as though I can sit in this position for the next two hours probably. I can just sit here and I can relax. And a lot of times when I'm playing, you know, when I'm playing sports or something, I'm, and I'm, you know, want to relax. This is exactly how I do it. And sometimes I find myself I can do this for, for a long time. Once you've done that, you've accomplished tama'nina. Now when it comes to the salah, the way you'll accomplish it is, you'll get into the ruku, and you feel that resting period for a split moment, then you can get out of it. This is not a ruku, what a lot of people do. They will get into the ruku. Allahu Akbar, Samir Allah, Hamida. Salah is broken. There's no tama'nina. Tama'nina literally means to have the bones rested in your body. So you get into the ruku, Allahu Akbar, you feel it relaxed. It only takes a few seconds. You get into it. You feel you're relaxed, go back into your sujood now. That's how you accomplish tama'nina. Tama'nina does not require a lot of effort, but it requires a lot of focus. You have to concentrate on what you're doing. Um, and when it comes into the jama'ah, this is not an issue, alhamdulillah, because for the jama'ah, you follow the imam anyways. The same is also for the sujood and also for the sitting position between the sujood as well. When it comes to the tama'nina as well, remember that this here, we're in a pillar of the, we're talking about the pillars of prayer. So what that means that if you don't do that, the whole salah is invalid. This all goes back to that one concept, do not pray like how the chicken pecks itself into the ground. Unfortunately, brothers and sisters, when Ramadan comes, insha'Allah, wherever, depending on where you go for taraweeh, you're going to find a lot of jama'ah and masajids doing this. They just want to rush through the taraweeh. I remember a long, long time ago, alhamdulillah, it was my first and last time I've ever prayed there. But we finish 21 raka'ats in 30 minutes. I don't... <laughs> I don't even know if it was fundamentally possible, but 30 minutes, we were done. And imagine every single night you're doing this. Now, inshallah, after the conference is over, I have, we will discuss preparation for the Ramadan. I will discuss with you the taraweeh and some of the fiqh behind the taraweeh as well. Eight raka'ats versus the 20 raka'ats and where did this all come from and some of the logistics behind it. We have a whole prep Ramadan series insha'Allah that is planned for you to look at some of these issues. So that will come at that time bi'idhnillah. The hadith continues. Then the Prophet ﷺ says to prostrate, tells the same man, prostrate until you are calmly prostrating. Fasjud hatta tatma inna sajidan. So go into the prostration until you feel that calmness as well. Then sit up until you are calmly sitting. 
then and then the Prophet says, from now on, do all of this in all of your prayers. This is a hadith in Bukhari. There are many a hadith like this in all of the Sunan books as well. Mention a similar hadith to this. This is extremely important, brothers and sisters. Whether it is a farud salah, a nafil, or a sunnah, it doesn't matter. Every single person, you must take your time and pray the salah correctly. Some of the ulama, they said that one of the signs of a salah for the munafiq, one of the signs to know that a person doesn't have that truthfulness or that finesse in their salah, is that the prayer in their home is the exact opposite of the prayer in the jama'ah. So in their home, they're speeding through the salah quickly, fast. But when they're in the jama'ah or, the, or, or when they're at the masjid, the salah is calm with all of the fundamentals. Everything has been done and put together. This is one of the signs of a, 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 a taste or an element of nifaq in the heart. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to protect us from this. In addition to that, we have the final tashahud. The final tashahud obviously is also part of a hadith narrated in Bukhari. And this was um, a dua that the Prophet ﷺ taught Ibn Mas'ud عنه, to say it in prayer. And eventually he taught all of the other companions as well. And obviously we all know this. At-tahiyyatu lillah wa salawat wa tayyibat until the end. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. Now in terms of this tahiyyat or this uh, tashahud. Now the tashahud officially ends when you send or when you do the shahada. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. At this point, this is when you're raising your index fin finger, right? So the question here is, when do you raise this index finger? And how do you do it when you're in the tashahud? There are three ways of doing this. There are many other ways, but there are three authentic ways of doing this. Number one is that when a person, they raise their finger, they raise it at the exact moment when they say the shahada. So the finger is down, it's, or it's just resting on your knees. And when you come to وَعَلَىٰ عِبَادِ اللَّهِ الصَّالِحِينَ وَأَشْهَدُ أَن لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ Now you have two choices here. After that's done, you can release the finger again, or you can keep the finger pointed. And by the way, the finger is not pointed to the sky as some believe, but the finger rather is directing itself towards the Qibla. So you have those two choices. You can either keep that or you can start to pound the finger like this. We'll talk about this. This is the second way now of how a tashahud or how raising the finger is done. The second way is that after you've done the tahiyya and you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu rasuluh, it's dua time. So you're sending peace and salutation, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad and so on till the end. And then you're asking Allah Azza wa Jal to protect you from the adhab al-qabr and the adhab al-nar wa fitnat al-mahiyya wa man wa fitnat al-masih al-dajjal. And then at this point, when it comes to your personal duas, you're, you're slowly tapping your fingers. The reason why, or one of the wisdoms as to why you do this is, according to one narration, some scholars differ on how authentic this narration is that when a person is making dua and they are pounding their fingers like this, the finger acts as though it is a hammer pounding at the shaitan himself in order to eliminate that distraction from them. So honestly speaking, this is probably one of the most effective forms of the tashahud, of raising the finger in the tashahud itself, is to slowly juggle the finger, juggle the index finger throughout the dua. The third method, so you have the first one, you're raising your finger when it comes to the actual shahada part itself. Not from the beginning of tahiyyat, but when you get to the ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, then you raise the finger. The second one is that you're going to juggle the fingers after you finish all of this, after you finish Allahumma salli, after you finish Allahumma uh, protect me from the adab and adab al qabr and so on, and you start making personal dua, you're starting to juggle the finger. Otherwise, you can keep it uh, forward facing the, the, the qibla. The third way is very unique. 
The, fir- the third way is a, is a method that many of the scholars of fiqh prefer this one, prefer this one method. And it's because it's based on a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Every time he would say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, he would raise his fingers. As a matter of fact, there is an even more specific narration that says when he actually said illallah, that's when he raised his finger. But every time before that, ashhadu an la ilaha, it was sort of like a halfway raise. You know, it just kind of halfway was raised. That's why you'll find some, some of the ulama when they're praying, their fingers look like this when they're in the tashahud. Then all of a sudden you'll notice that their finger suddenly gets stronger as, as if some life has been put into it and it gets a bit stronger for that moment. And then it kind of just rests there for, that, for the rest of the tashahud. The third way of doing this is when you say Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. So when you get to illallah, this is also a third authentic method of how to do the, the, the raising of the finger in the tashahud. Let's summarize. Brothers and sisters, honestly speaking, I'm going to tell you what Sheikh Mukhtar al-Shanqiti hafizahullah told all of us when we were sitting in the halaqah and he was teaching us muwatta and we came across his hadith. He came to and he said to us, Wallahi, this is an issue that should never be a major concern. Don't make this a major problem or a major issue in your salah. It's a very minor part of the salah itself. Whether you raise your fingers or not, whether you want to do it in a certain spot or this and that. He just went on for about maybe a good five or seven minutes just telling us, don't make this a major issue when it comes to the salah itself. Inshallah, all of these three methods are okay. You know, some people, they like to do various things with this, with this uh, finger. Like, you know, this finger sometimes for some people acts like a magic wand in the salah. And they start doing all sorts. I remember, I, I remember noticing a brother beside me, not here, like in another place. And he was doing this with the finger. I don't know what this means, you know. It's like, you know, those, you know, m- my basketball fans, you know, Dikembe Mutombo, you know what he used to do, right? So it's like, I don't know, they're having that moment in the soul. I don't know what it is. So there's a lot of really strange things that people do, and I don't know for what the, what the reason is behind it. But inshallah, we try our very best to stick to the most authentic ways based on our knowledge and study. The final point, inshallah, that we want to conclude is when it comes to the final sitting position, I think this is very clear. We don't need to really demonstrate this. When you're in the final tashahud, the left cheek is touching the ground and your left leg is sort of tucked in. So the left cheek is actually on the ground itself. Now, the reason why you do this in the final tashahud is, of course, this is to indicate that the salah is going to finish now. So if a latecomer were to walk into the jama'ah and sees the people sitting this way, automatically he knows this is the final raka'ah itself. So that's also part of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umar ibn al-Khattab, he used to do that, sitting on his left cheek in the whole salah, first tashahud and last. So one of his companions came up to him and said, Ya Umar, like, why do you do